Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Question and Answer from People in Greece. And it is part of the general discussion series. It was presented in Athens, Greece on the 12th of February 2012. Now, you don't have to stay for this conversation, but uh, if you want to wish to, that's fine. I'll, I will just uh, answer what I feel about Earth changes and how they might affect your location. However, you must understand, uh, as I've said last time, that I am not yet at one with God, so therefore cannot give you clear answers and direction. Um, all I can do is tell you what I feel at this point in time. Secondly, um, the last time we had this discussion, many people got into fear. And my suggestion is, if you're in fear from anything I say, deal with your fear, as we've been suggesting. You know, feel your fear and, and work your way through your fear. And don't let your fear suppress your desire. So in other words, always try to put your desires above your fears. OK. So uh, what would you like to know? The date and the time. The date and the time. <laughs> On July the 23rd, you know, like... <laughs> um, yeah, uh, why do we want to know the date and the time? Run away from it. Well, can you see, can you see already it's sort of like um, our fear is saying to us, if we know the date and the time, then we'll know what to do before that date and time. But, but that's not a good way to live your life. A good way to live your life is to live in passion and desire and let your spirit guides, as we talked to you about yesterday, sort of guide you into being in the right location at the right date and time. <laughs> whereas whereas what, what many, I feel, are doing is that there's a few things I feel that you're doing here in Greece. One, you're not challenging your desires. You're not working out what you really, really, really want to do with your life. I mean long term, for good. Not, not just short term, but long term. Secondly, um, you know and some, some of you feel that Greece itself is going to have a fair bit of turmoil. Firstly, obviously financial turmoil, leading up to potentially political turmoil, and then leading into potentially like earth change turmoil. You understand all of these things. And yet, you still, to a degree, want to not act upon it, not do something about it. And when I say do something about it, make some personal choices to choose where you're going to be and where you're going to live and what you're going to do with your life that will meet your passions and desires. Um, so, so a lot of times I feel that Earth Change discussion is really more about are you prepared to engage your passions and desires today and from now on and then be guided as to where you eventually will live. Now, many of us are, are strongly addicted to our location of living. Like, this is why we grow up in a country and why often we spend the rest of our life in the same country, because we're often addicted to just being in the location for some reason. Now, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's job, sometimes it's all sorts of things like that. My suggestion is to reappraise your life and look at what you really would like to do in the long term and then ask yourself, are these desires getting met in your current location, wherever you live? Now, for those of you who live here in Greece, ask yourself, is Greece giving me, is, is Greece the place where I can develop these desires that I have? And if it is, then stay in Greece. That's OK. If it's not, then make choices and decisions to find another place that does meet your passions and desires, a place that will, in the long run, uh, cause your growth, but also cause you to um, fully engage your passions and desires. Now, in terms of practical things, um, every single person on the planet who takes personal responsibility for four basic things will find survival in the coming world very much easier than, than not. There's four basic things that you need to embrace or if you want to find survival easy. 
The first one is you must learn to address your fears. Because if you don't address your fears, your fears will attract a group of events no matter where you live. So you need to address your fears. And to do that, you need to find out what they are. Now, for some of you, it's like financial instability. For some of you, it's like, you know, fear of anarchy, fear of uh, revolt, fear of rebellion. And those fears are already coming out here in Greece, aren't they? They're already starting to raise their head. And so the key is to look at these fears, see what goes on, and look at these fears. Yeah? The second thing that needs to be addressed is to examine your desires and follow them more strongly than you ever have before. So in other words, don't let single days go past while you're not doing what you desire to do. Address your desires and follow them as much as you possibly can. The third thing is to take personal responsibility for all of your life, including your own physical necessities. Now, this is something that all of us should be doing, whether earth changes were coming or not. We need to take our personal responsibility for all of our physical necessities. Now, what I mean by that is not that you pay somebody else for your water, but rather that you provide your own water. Not that you pay somebody else for your food, but rather that you have the ability to, to create your own food. And not that you pay somebody else for your shelter or your comfort in your shelter, but you create a location that is comfortable without needing another person to create that comfort. Now, if we look at that from a practical situation, that means obviously living in a place where you can collect water, living in a place where you can grow food, and living in a place where you have a high degree of personal comfort that you can provide for yourself, not from the environment. So in other words, our dependency on electricity causes us to be comfortable. But what if the electricity failed tomorrow? How comfortable would we be? Right? Now, for some of you, you still might be comfortable, so it doesn't, you don't need to worry about that. For others, you might find that you need a heater. So get, a, get another form of heating and have some way to feed that other form of heating, some sustainable way of feeding that other form of heating. Or you might finish up needing more clothes when it's cold rather than having as much heating. So do that. Get some more clothes. Um, those kind of things are part of your necessities. So the third point was take responsibility for all of your own physical necessities. Now, for myself and Mary, what that's meant for us is that we have got water tanks on our property where we collect water. We have created a system so that we can have a hot shower if we want to, even if there's no electricity. And, uh, and we can have a bath, even if we want to, if there's no electricity with the way we've created it. And we can also grow our own food if we wish. We can grow our own fruit and our own vegetables if we want to do so. We've got everything in place for us to do that. We've got the tools that we need, we've got a bit of land to do it on, all of those things we've got so that we can do it. And there are many other people who are doing the same thing. You don't have to buy it, you can oftentimes just rent it. <laughs> you don't have to buy things necessarily, you can rent them. Here in Europe, you have the ability to move pretty much anywhere in the European Union. So you can create whatever you want, wherever you want, pretty much, in the, in, in the scope of being in Europe. Now, my suggestion would be to find some places that are actually, that feel much safer than Greece, and maybe consider moving to those locations, even if you moved as a group or collectively to those locations, you could then have already made a little community where each of you makes certain things and then are able to support each other. That is far better than living in the middle of a city where you're completely dependent upon electricity, you're completely dependent upon other people providing food, and you're completely dependent on pumped water. Those, those dependencies are going to cause us problems in the long term. Whether earth changes occur or not, they're still going to cause us problems in the long term. Every time we're dependent upon another person and don't want to take personal responsibility, 
we are always going to eventually finish up causing ourselves problems. So my suggestion would be to embrace this idea of personal responsibility and to look at the personal responsibility with the essentials. And the essentials are your food, your water and your shelter, your environment. They are the main essentials. So I've mentioned three things and the fourth thing and probably the fourth thing should have been first, is that we need to understand that if we trust God and trust in God's laws and follow our desires, we will always be led to the right location if we do that. So the key is how do we connect to God? Focus on connecting to God every day as a part of this process. If you connect to God, it, you're forced automatically to be connected with yourself. And when you connect to yourself, you connect to your own feelings, your own passions, your own desires. That's very powerful for you working out what you want in your life. When you connect to God, you also now connect to an external being who has all the knowledge that you want and need for your long-term enjoyment of life. So if you focus on the connection to God, you will always come out better than if not. And if, it, and if you do pass, you'll be in a better condition than if you didn't. You see? So if you do each of those things, you will be in a better condition whether you pass or not. Now, if you were asking for practical where in Europe might be safe or those kind of things, then I can give you answers about those kind of things if you wish, of where I feel that it might be safe. But I don't feel there's many places in Europe <laughs> that will be safe, to be honest. Mainly because you're so all the countries are so close together. And... Um, and therefore, if a big event occurs, a big uh, volcanic event, so forth, happens, or plate shifts happen, that's going to affect most of your, most of the plate. So it's going to affect most of the countries involved. Um, Spain and Portugal are on a different plate than you are, you are on, and so there is a potential that there will be some degree of survivability in locations in protected locations in Spain, in Spain in particular, uh, on, near the Portugal border and towards the south. But pretty much everywhere else in Europe is going to struggle uh, and, and have a high degree of cataclysmic events that affect the population. So in terms of timing, the question was asked, at this stage I feel the timing is around July of this year um, for those cataclysmic events to begin occurring. Um, I'm not sure of the sequence at this point um, in terms, but, but I'm expecting that the cataclysmic events will be completed by the end of November. So, and they will affect all of the earth, not just here or any, uh, any one single location. Yeah. Christina. Um, in the summer, I had a dream <clears throat> that I felt in two days the earth changes will happen. And I told my family, and I told them, and we need to go to a specific little city in Albania. Yeah. Which called, like, I saw it in my dream. I have no idea of the map of Albania. I don't know about cities, anything. Yeah. And I woke up and I Googled it. And it really exists, and it's exactly how I saw it in my dream. Right. So it's, trust these kind of things. But it's even close to Italy. <laughs> there you go. But, yeah, but there like might be, it might be more survivable. Yeah. You, you need to start trusting these things. And, and, and it may be a temporary thing. Like, do you understand? You go to that location, check it out, and that leads you to going to another location. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and this is what we were saying yesterday. Uh, follow up on some of these things rather than just talking about them but don't do anything yes. about them. Follow up. Have a look at the location. See how you feel when you're in the location. Mm. If you feel safer there than here, then continue, consider going there uh, or, or, or temporarily going there even to check it out. Um, that's, that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There will be pockets of uh, Europe that will survive earth changes in the long run. It's just how comfortable you'll be during the no, changes. In my dream, I had to take gas mask with me. Yes. If you're going to be in Albania or even here, you yeah. will definitely need one hmm. um, because of the amount of ash 
uh, volcanic ash that will be in the sky pretty constantly over a long period, you will definitely need one. Yeah. Okay. But again, you see, if in a dream you had a ghost mask, then that would tell me that, oh, I probably need to get one of those, you see. <laughs> I would trust that, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> what is it? It's close to Greece. Close to Greece, yeah. Nika, you want to put the mic there? As Christine did it, I also try to connect with myself. You know, what, I, what do I really desire to do? And the, what I felt is that my... It's like a, my soul, me, wants to live. Mm -hmm. And my soul, it, I, I feel it's like a third person because. <laughs> it's not, though. <laughs> I know it's not. So far away. You yeah, can. but that's how I'm going to. Yeah, describe it. Describe it. Wants to go to a place uh, in uh, Ioannina, it's, 30 it's 20 kilometers from the border of Albania. There are two big uh, rivers and one lake over there, mm -hmm. and uh, go there, and you will have everything you need to survive. Yep. But it doesn't mention any of the comfort. It says you have a tent, you know how to survive. In everything is arranged for you. Yep. And then I had to cry because I felt that my soul was cruel. Your soul is cruel to you. Yeah, I, I, I want some comfort, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. cruel to me. Yeah. And uh, I said that I don't know how to go there and fix things. And they said, it's easier they, because I had also guidance. Some guides, yeah. Do you think that arriving there at the last minute will make things easier for you or harder. Exactly. Maybe it's better, you know, just to pick up your stuff, leave, go there and see what happens. Yes. Yeah. And try to survive, you know. Well, th this is one thing that you need to also consider. Personal responsibility does not leave anything to the last minute generally. What personal responsibility does is it works out what you desire and then it doesn't wait for other people to agree with your desire, and it doesn't wait for other people to create it for you, it actually goes ahead and creates it for yourself. Now, when I'm p completely personally responsible, I will not wait for Nico to go to Albania, right? If it was me, I would go to Albania. If, that's, I, had, if I had the guidance to go to Albania, I would go to Albania and already start setting up things so that I could learn to live there, learn a bit of the language, learn how everything works, learn the, about the land, plant some seeds, you know, grow some things, collect, you know, all those things. And the most beautiful thing, I find it beautiful, but I'm not certain of it. It's about five to eight years ago, a lot of villages in that area were abandoned because they, no, they, only one family or two stayed there, yeah. you know, in the whole <laughs> village, and the rest is empty. Yeah. And so you already have some... Uh, it, there is already comfort there, if <laughs> somebody A degree wants of comfort, yeah. to, to go and work, of course, eh, because if it's abandoned, it's, it needs some personal... Of course, of course. But and, that's the... And I agree with your guides completely, Nico. If you lay, wait until the last minute, you are going to find it much, much more difficult than if you do something about it soon and actually go up there in the process of enjoying it and, and learning in the process and, and, and experiencing yeah. the process. Learning. And even if it comes, it comes to, like, June and you say, this is not for me, at least you've followed some of the inspiration you've received and learnt something in the process, right? But what, you, what a lot of people around uh, where we live have found is that they've reluctantly done things only to find that actually there's a lot of their passions involved in what they finished up doing 
and now they're really, really happy that they've done those things. And often that's what you find with uh, doing things like moving and so forth. You often find that, that you reluctantly do it initially because you have all these fears, but after a while you get so, you enjoy the lifestyle so much that you wonder what the hell you were afraid of before then. Yeah. I used to live like that. In, in, I already, I haven't been to that place, but I, I had uh, made an excursion planned for a lot of people to go there. Yeah. So I really know how it is, how it feels. I like it. Yeah, yeah. So, so allow yourself to experience. If, if, you're, if you're receiving some inspiration to go to a location, don't put it off until the last minute. Go and prepare it and, and live there for a bit, see what it's like. If you don't like it, you've then got time you can change. You can do something else. And they even pointed out why I don't act. And why was that? Yeah, there were several fears. Yeah, yeah. Should I name them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the problem with extreme cold, because I've lived in minus uh, 15 degrees, I've slept in minus 15 degrees yep. outside in a tent, yeah. and it was not a, f a fun, it, it wasn't fun thing to do. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, I had a really nice sleeping bag, which I praise God I bought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but each time I changed sides and the feathers of the sleepy bank moved, immediately <laughs> it was frozen. The, the, frozen. <laughs> it, it was like a knife, you know, inside my... It was too much, man. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since, I, I, I can cope with extreme cold, but not for prolonged periods. Right. It's not fun. <laughs> And there will be extreme cold for prolonged periods. I know that. And that's what they try me to process. Of course, if you go to the middle of Africa, there won't be extreme cold. For yeah, but periods. in the middle of Africa, you have other issues. <laughs> exactly. And other fears. <laughs> and you see that no matter what you choose, you're going to have some fears. <laughs> yes, of course. But to be honest, I feel more comfortable with the fears in... Uh, in uh, near, let's say, Albania. In Albania. No, 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 it's in Greece, this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's very close. Yeah. So you feel com more comfortable there than in the middle of Morocco, <laughs> in Africa? No. In the middle of the Morocco would <laughs> be maybe nice. maybe Nigeria. Nigeria? No, man. <laughs> Nigeria, Angola and Congo? No, 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 no. But Nigeria is a safe place. <laughs> Not for white people. <laughs> Last time... Uh, Last time a friend of mine went there, uh, he had an escort of, uh, of the army. You know, one jeep in front, one jeep... Uh, <laughs> because he was white. No, I don't want to live like that. <laughs> Can you see, though, that wherever you go, you will have fears to address? And, and, and this is the thing, is that um, in the end, if you've got fears there to address, fears there to address, fears there to address, in the end, a lot of the times, we have so many fears to address in every place we think of, we finish up staying exactly where the, we are. In the same place. <laughs> and in the end, you'll have even more fears to address doing that. Why? Because you're living in fear by staying where you are. I don't, I don't grasp it. No, I know. But it's a very important principle that I'm trying to get across to you. When you feel frozen to mm -hmm. move to different locations through your desires or through your inspiration, you finish up staying where you are. Okay. But you stay where you are with the maximum amount of fear inside of you. Because uh. none of your fear is getting addressed. Because okay. of that, your, all of those fears are going to create fear-based events. So the okay. reality is, unless many of you do something, at least something you will end up having the most of your fears challenged in the location where you currently are. Now I got it. Do you understand? Yes. Is that, does that, did I explain that properly? <coughs> By staying frozen, you are actually living in your fear the most. And by living in your fear the most, where you currently are is going to finish up attracting everything you're afraid of. That means, mm. if, I, if I grasp it correctly, I'm afraid, let's say, of a wave. And because I act, of course, I am afraid of other things. But in order to challenge, I have to create a tsunami to come in order to face my fear against the wave. 
Yeah, and you're not the only person afraid of a wave, obviously. No, I'm not afraid <laughs> of the waves. No, I'm not. No? My, my grandmother did, I did. <laughs> That's why I became a seaman. If I was True. afraid of water... Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you have some fears, yeah. but most of your fears are to do with comfort and emotions. Yes. Yes? And what I'm saying is that staying where you currently are is actually living in most of those fears. Yeah. If you at least moved somewhere, even temporarily, yeah. you'd have to address some of those fears. Yeah. So therefore, you would have less fears if you process through them. Yeah. And that's going to be better for you in the long run. Whether you pass or not, it's immaterial. It's going to be better for you in the long yeah. run having less fears. I know. Yeah. Okay. Katarina? So what if you have decided that you don't want to do any long-term stuff, but you know what you immediately want to do? So you have a desire that right now, I really want to go do this. But then you don't have the funds to do that. You don't have the money to do that. Does that mean you don't really want to do that or you have other issues to deal with? Yes. So the funds will come. Yes. So, so if you really want to do something but the funds aren't present for you to do them, it means you have issues with money and you need to address them. And you definitely have issues with money, so you need to address them. When, when you address them, then the funds will come. Does that make sense? So don't give up your desires just because you can't do it. <coughs> Keep hold of your desire and then realise, oh, it's not happening because I've got these other problems. And I need to address these other problems, emotionally address them. When I address them emotionally, I will create something different and I'll get the funds needed to follow this desire. Does that make sense? Yes. Because it is there. That desire has been there for over six months now, mm -hmm. per se. The particular one. But the fear has been there much longer <laughs> and also is not being addressed. Because if the, the money issue hasn't been addressed at all. Well, the fear, not the money, the fear. Because have, not having money is not about the money, it's about the fear. Okay. The right? fear of not having money. The fear of, of what? Specifically? Well, it, it, sometimes it can be the fear of having money. <laughs> right? See, see, it depends on what the childhood right. emotion is all about, right? Now, many of us hate money, literally. Many of you hate money. Like you say, oh, I don't hate money, I'd love to have more money. No. You hate money because, because you don't want to look after money. I don't know, many, many people are like this, like you give them the accounts to do and they put it off and put it off to the last minute. If you're one of those people, you hate money. Because the reality is if you loved money, just like you loved everything else, you would actually do the accounts as soon as you had them. As soon as you got the bill, you want to pay it. If you love money, that's what you like. But if you put it off and put it off and put it off, you don't like money as much. There's something going on. You're afraid of something. You're afraid maybe of not having enough. You're afraid maybe of, uh, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, you're afraid of uh, things to do with what the lack of money brings you or you're afraid of what too much money brings you, right? Or it, many times it's to do with emotions that we have from our childhood. So when mum and dad argued, what did they argue about? A lot of times, money. Sometimes sex. <laughs> A lot of times money. Right? So, so there are the things that we then have tied up in money too. Like, so we're afraid of our relationship if certain things happen with money. And there's all sorts of issues that we have emotionally with regard to money. In fact, I, I feel that the issues that most people have about money are very, very large because we, we've grown up in a monetary society that is heavily fear-based. And so we're going to have huge amounts of issues with money to do, deal with and address. Most people on the planet have no idea about money. No idea at all. They don't know how money works even. They don't, they don't know how... They don't understand flow. They don't understand that money is like water. Do you understand that money is like water? Yes. How is it like water? Can I explain? Can you? <laughs> Everything in nature... Just hold the mic a bit okay. further. Everything in this nature is um, self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Now, if we stop the... Uh, 
if there is scarcity in people and they don't have enough money to spend, then the rest of the money will not flow because there will not be transactions. Mm -hmm. They will. It's like uh, chemistry, uh, amphidromous uh, equ equations uh, from both sides. Mm -hmm. If you cut one side, then it goes only to one side and stays there. Yes. So it's not. It's not continuable. It's not sufficient. So, so the most loving use of money is for money to exchange hands. Yeah. But continually exchange hands. Yeah, to change. Does that make not sense? Not to so hoard it. It's everybody then. If you if you hoard it, what does it do? It stagnates. It stagnates. Now, most of us want to hoard our money. Like most people I know, still hoard their money. Uh, that's why you keep what's called a bank balance. Right. Well, what myself and Mary do, or I should probably say what I do. <laughs> Mary still has issues with the flow. <laughs> Mary still has issues with the flow, she said. And is every bit of money that we get, we spend. Every bit. Because, because when I spend it, I create something. I not only create something for ourselves or something for somebody else, like in the case we spend it on DVDs, we're creating truth available to lots of people. We, we spend it on a sound system, I can record things and put it on the internet and that gives truth to a lot of people. If I spend it on our property, planting some trees, that gives more to the environment and, it, and provides more food for our animals and, and people and, and all those kind of things. If you spend it, it has some value. If you keep it in your bank, what value yes, does no. it have? has no value to you whatsoever. It's just a piece of paper written down on a record on a bank statement. And the instant any, any um, economic problems occur, you'll lose it. So it has no benefit. It only has benefit while it flows. It only has benefit while you do something with it. And yet I see more and more people, like when there's an economic collapse or something happening, more people want their bank balance bigger. Why would you want your bank balance bigger? I want it smaller. <laughs> you know, because, because I can do more with that. I can create more with that. I can do more in terms of self-responsibility and creating things for other people with that money. So, so you don't have a feeling. And also when you love, you don't have a feeling of limitation. So you don't go, there's my bank balance, that's all I can spend. If I did that. We wouldn't have ever bought anything, probably. I, I look at my bank balance and I go, it's too much money in there. No matter how much money is in there, it's too much. <laughs> because, because if there's money sitting there, it means that I'm not spending it. I'm not creating and I'm also not exchanging it. I'm not using it to give to others or, you know, in exchange. Something's, it's not flowing. And if I see money not flowing, I feel there's instantly an issue. There's an issue with me. I'm wanting to hoard my money. <coughs> I'm wanting to... I'm thinking that this money gives me security. I believe money gives me money in the bank gives me security. That's not true. You, you, do, do any of you remember, or perhaps parents do, the time of the war, in the Second World War? Money was useless, totally useless. Any time there is a time of stress in humanity, money is totally useless. It's, it's pointless having it. You need to have goods. You need to have things that other people need <laughs> to exchange. Right? This is the reality. So rather than spending, uh, so rather than hoarding our money in a bank, which means that it all at some point will disappear, or if it's not going to disappear, it's still stagnant. It's still not doing anything for you. You need to do things with it. You need to create with it, just like you would create anything else. You need to create with it. So the goods is most likely seeds or... or well, if you look or... at my previous discussion, I said there's, there's the issues of self-responsibility, which are water, water uh, food, yeah. shelter. That's the first thing you would spend your money on. Once all of that's looked after, then you would spend your money on helping other people to let, come to know truth. If you really loved other people, that's what you would do. So you would spend the rest of your money helping other people to come to know truth. And, and that's what myself, that's what I do. 
with Mary now, <laughs> with our money. <laughs> and Mary goes along with it at the moment. <laughs> I, I see the wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> she sees the wisdom that doesn't always feel it. Really. So also then, if you have acquired a lot of stuff, say, to sustain yourself and your family, it would be unloving to exchange food for something else for another person. You would have to give it to them if you feel that... If you love them, you would want to give them the gift. So That's if you loved other people, you would want to give them the gift of, of what you can create, certainly. Um, if they demanded it, then I probably wouldn't give it because anybody who demands anything is being unloving. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. But, uh, but also we've got to look at what is essential and what isn't. You see, you see, a lot of us have got a lot of unessential things in our lives. We carry around this deep burden of unessential things um, none of which engage our passions, none of which engage our desires, and none of which are essential to our life. And yet we carry them around. When we move, we pack them all up as press of possessions into boxes, and then we move to the new location and unpack them all and put them away in their proper locations, never to see them or use them again, and to, except to look at them. And then when we move again, we grab them all and pack them all up again. And we've got to start asking ourselves, what is this value of this thing to me emotionally? Because it's no value to me in any other way. If I'm not using it every day and I don't, it doesn't have a role in my life and it's not helping me create my passions and desires and satisfy my desires, then, then there's got to be some emotional addictive reason why I'm carrying it around with me all the time. You're speaking of emotional baggage now. No, I'm talking about physical baggage. <laughs> All of our physical baggage is the result of emotions that we don't want to release and those physical things are like attached to emotions inside of us. So, so many of us take knickknacks like, like this to be an example. Sorry to... <laughs> What's its role? <laughs> the flame isn't big enough to light anything. It doesn't provide any heat. <laughs> So its only single role is to look good. To look good. Well, well, God never does anything with one role. Everything God does is with more than one role. It has to look good and smell good. It has to look good, taste good and smell good. It has to, everything God does has multiple purposes. So, so God would look at that and go, hmm, what could I use that for? A glass? It's not big enough <laughs> for a glass for most things. It's not big enough for a urine cup, even. <laughs> um, what do I do? <laughs> oh, I could use it to build a wall, maybe, because glass can provide insulation and so forth if I put it inside of a wall. And it's got air gap and, and therefore insulation properties. That might be good. Or I might melt it down and make a bigger glass I can drink from. Maybe that would be good. But, but can you see how a lot of the things that we have have no purpose except for one thing only, and usually it's just to look pretty, and it has no other functionality whatsoever. Those kind of things do not survive in our house. They don't survive. I wasn't going to take that one. Yeah, they, 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 they don't survive. <laughs> <laughs> what about this one? <laughs> you going to take that one too? None of that. What about, what about this one? Or this one, or this one, or this one. Can you see a lot of the things we collect have no purpose to them at all. We don't even, we, we like them once, but we don't enjoy them even after we get them most of the time. We don't even notice them there most of the time. Anything you don't notice on a daily basis, you've got to ask yourself, why is it there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, now I can understand that being there. For example, yeah. I look at that every time I come in in the morning. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I can understand that being there. It it, it it can bring joy. It also looks pretty. It also fills the void. It has a number of purposes. Mm -hmm. Right. Plus, I'm assuming you could maybe fold it up and fan it. So it has another purpose. And. And this is the thing is that everything God does has lots and lots of purposes, all, to, all rolled into one. And, and what we need to do ourselves is we need to start looking at this as a, a, our life, our entire life, and go, anything in our life that doesn't serve a daily purpose and, and multiple roles, why have I got it? 
why don't I give it away to somebody who appreciates it <laughs> and who can use it for multiple purposes? Um, mind you, some of these things I don't think anybody <laughs> could use for multiple purposes. But, but, uh, but sometimes, you know, it's better being in the tip or, or in the ground, broken up, than it is being on our shelf. Because of... And uh, often it's only there because of an emotional reason. Right, right. Like somebody bought it for us. My who, mother gave it to me. Yeah, my mother gave it to me. Yeah? yeah, so somebody bought it for us and we want the love from somebody and we're not really getting love from them and so we think we need the thing to show us that they loved us at one point, right? They are the kind of emotional purposes that most of these things uh, support. Once we are really focused on loving ourselves, loving other people, loving our environment, taking self-responsibility and also making our life just focused on our desires, then we reduce everything down to that. We take away all the things that prevent us from focusing on our desires, all the things that take up space in our life. We get rid of them. We, we only want the things that are going to be supportive of our passions and desires, supportive of our nature and personality. And when we do that, when we actually embrace life like that, what happens is that we automatically get rid of huge amounts of clutter, huge amounts of possessions, and we're left with the very simple possessions that we need to create our desires. Now, for some of you, that might mean a whole... You get rid of your, all of your lounge suite and all of your kitchen setting and all of your other, a lot of your other stuff and you're left with your bed, and then you buy a studio for music mixing. <laughs> Instead of having all that other stuff, your lounge room is filled with your studio. Does that make sense? Mm. And, and that is now supporting your desire. If you have a desire for music production, that would be supporting the desire. If your desire was to, do, to learn how to play musical instruments and, and do a couple of them, you would be willing to sell furniture and get rid of stuff and, and just buy two musical instruments instead with some sheet music or music you can carry around with yourself. And that's what you would do. You, your focus changes from the mundane into your passions. You, you start embracing your passions fully. And what I would recommend to everybody is that they do that. And, and don't wait for anything to do that. You don't wait for earth changes. You don't wait for the right economic times. You don't wait for anything. When you embrace your passions like that, Everything just seamlessly happens. I've seen, I've seen people, uh, like uh, I've seen a 14-year-old girl. Her mother and father don't want to buy a horse. She's passionate for a horse. She badly wants a horse. She actually goes to a horse place, a stable. She learns how to look after a horse. She goes there every day for nearly two years learning how to look after a horse that's not her own. Those people she worked for gave her a horse. So she finished up getting exactly what she wanted, even though her mum and dad didn't want to buy one. Uh, I've seen this happen over and over and over again, just by following the passion, even though it's not happening exactly how you want it. Yeah? And, and I feel that's an essential part of your, our life, both here on earth and in the spirit world. And if you can embrace that, you'll find yourself led to locations as well. But don't allow your fear to dictate any of these decisions. And don't allow your emotions with mum to keep this in your house. Deal with your emotions with mum, or whatever it is. <laughs> it's the vase. Oh, it's the vase. Yeah. Don't allow emotions with mum, you know, if this was the one. Don't allow emotions with mum to keep this in your house. Deal with the emotions with mum, and then you know what you want to do with this? <laughs> do you understand? Because you no longer feel an attachment to this, you'll either feel an attachment to mum or you'll have dealt with your sadness that you don't have an attachment with your mother. Yeah. Okay. Instead, what we do is we hold on to things a lot because of nostalgia. And nostalgia is always a big indication of large emotions underneath that we're not allowing ourselves to address. Yeah. So my, my suggestion is to do, do it that way. Rita? Yeah. Um. What about India and China and Africa and Russia? Are they safe countries? Safe uh, let's go through them. China, a fair portion of China is going to be very unsafe. 
It's, uh, it's got high population. It's going to have large num uh, amount of high, uh, very high water in, in inundation. Because it's on the shelf of the Pacific Ocean, and the whole Pacific Ocean is going to move north at one point. So there's just going to be intense flooding in the majority of China. What was the next one you asked for? Uh, India. India. The same applies with India. Most of the Indian Ocean will be moving north, and they'll have huge flooding in most of their low-lying areas right up until the mountains at the top of India. And Africa? Africa is going to be relatively safe in almost all locations except for coastal areas. So Africa is going to be pretty much safe right the way around Africa. And Russia? Russia is going to be fairly safe right the way around Russia. Almost in most locations around Russia will be safe. Thank you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Plenty, of go. Plenty of places to go. Yeah. The, the earth is your oyster. <laughs> <laughs> um, South America is the only continent you haven't asked for. Uh, South America, yeah. Um, right <laughs> the way up the other side of the Andes Mountains, the the uh, west, uh, the eastern yes. side of the Andes Mountains, will be very safe location in Africa, in in, in South America. And the United States and Canada. United States will be very unsafe, very unsafe. The majority Canada. of them, I'd say. Uh, Canada, there will be parts of Canada that would be quite safe. Uh, similar degrees of safety to parts of Europe. Um, but, but in particular, there will be places more to the north in Canada that will be more safe. Uh, because of the, eastern, the western side of Canada being connected to the uh, Pacific Plate movements, a lot of the western side of Canada will be very unsafe. Thank you. No worries. Australia? Australia and all, all of the coastal areas of Australia will be quite unsafe, but there will be places inland and, and along the ranges, the other, the, what's called the western side of the ranges on the east coast of Australia, will be relatively safe. Yeah. Western Australia, most of the cities in Australia will be very unsafe. Now, I have the issue that um, I feel until now I don't have any inspiration to move anywhere, yep. <laughs> except for maybe Germany, which I've had for a while. Yeah. Um, now, it doesn't feel right either to just pack up my stuff and go somewhere where I've heard that it might be a safe place. I agree. Right. So I kind of fear that I will not be able to, I don't know, get hear from my guidance or, you know, feel in a way at some stage that Understand that there's, a, there's, there's the issue of do we have a desire to know? Yeah. And now for many of us, we do not have a desire mm. to know. That's why we haven't received any inspiration. Right. So many people on the planet have no desire at all to know what will happen, what will come. And as a result of that, they have no desire to listen to any inspiration from their guides or their guardians, and they have no desire to enter into any discussion about earth change matters. Now, my personal feelings about that are not desiring to know is exactly the same as burying your head in the sand mm. and has basically the same result. Mm. And that is you will eventually just stay where you want to be mm. and take pot luck, as the saying goes, or, you know, just be lucky or not lucky, depending on the location yeah. you've chosen at the time. Yeah. And my suggestion is, if you don't have any clear guidance, my suggestion is to look at your fears about knowing. Mm. So that's what I would be addressing. What are my fears associated with knowing? Mm. Yeah. And usually what you find is that there's quite a lot of fears that we have associated with knowing the truth about things. Yeah. And so, so we have fears associated with knowing the truth about who's my soulmate, who isn't. Yeah. Uh, very good movie, by the way, to trigger those fears is called Timer. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, it's a bit of a B-grade movie, but it's, <laughs> but it's a good movie 
for addressing a lot of issues about why you don't want to know who your soulmate is and all those kind of things. Right? <laughs> and there are fears that we have about future events, shall we call them. Right? So fears, those fears are usually emotional in some way and they're usually attached to something to do with our family or our lifestyle. So in other words, we don't want to conceive that our lifestyle may have to change significantly and so we bury our head in the sand so that way we don't have to change anything in our lifestyle. Um, we don't want to uh, confront our family by moving away from them and so we don't bother moving away from them. Um, even though we might have inspiration to do something different, we, we neglect that inspiration. So my suggestion is if you are not receiving inspiration about what to do, where to go, and also inspiration about your passions and desires, then look at what you do not want to know. What are you, what are you afraid of knowing? That's what I would address. Yep. Um, I'm not saying that uh, there are many people who talk, I talk to on a daily basis who have no desire to know about earth changes at all. And I don't see earth changes as a big issue um, because, because I feel that whether you pass or don't pass, the issues are the same. You still have to engage your desires, you still have to do with your fears, you still need to learn to connect to God, you still need humility, love and truth in your life. So I don't really see earth changes as a major change to any of those factors. The real question, I suppose, is do I wish to live on earth during these beautiful changes or do I want to go to the spirit world and experience the changes there? Right? Yeah. Um, many people on the planet have already made up their mind yeah. that they do not want to live on earth but they've made up their mind because they are afraid of what the earth will be like afterwards yeah. and they don't want to address their fears and discomforts. Yeah. So they haven't made up their mind for a pure loving reason. They've only made up their line from, from a fear-based reason. Which means their fear will be addressed in the spirit world. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Does that answer the question okay, though? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, have some, you have a question. You have one? Sarah? Yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go. Um, I just wanted to say um, I spent time on the Gold Coast before I came over here and uh, I was just feeling into the safety of that and the people there. And it's like they're the walking dead at the moment. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> like, they just... They're not even there, like, yeah. and they're just, yeah. They well, they're, don't... they're fully involved in their facade lifestyle. Yes, exactly. And yep. they're, like, filling every space so yes. that, yeah. Yeah, but they're not connected with the earth. They're not connected with themselves. Yeah. It's a, yeah, the Gold Coast, for those of you, uh, is on the east coast of Australia, south of Brisbane and north of Sydney, and uh, it's all along the coast, um, the Pacific coast, so, yeah. So yeah, I, I agree totally. When you, when you fully connect to a location, you can even feel whether this location is going to satisfy any of your desires or not, any of your passions or not. And when I go to the Gold Coast, which we sometimes do still, and my, my feelings are it's, it does not supply any of my passions or desires at all. What about the beach? Um, the beach does. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. And, and one other passion is I meet, I meet in Gold Coast is to, to share the truth with people. So there, there's two passions, but aside from that, no others. Mm. Whereas where I live satisfies the majority of my desires at the moment. So, so even just going where your desires are satisfied the most is more powerful choice than living somewhere where everybody's just in the facade. Mm. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. They've, they have, they've made their choice though. Yep. And the yeah, majority of people on the planet have already made their choice yeah. as to whether they wish to survive changes or, or not. And uh, the majority on the planet do not wish to survive changes. Mm. Um, they would prefer to pass. Most of them prefer to pass very quickly. Yep. And uh, they believe that in passing very quickly that there'll be less trauma and so forth which is not the case, because once they enter the spirit world, they'll be quite traumatised with the experience in the spirit world. Mm. Yeah. Rita. Yeah, so about 29 years ago, mm -hmm. um, 
we migrated to Australia because of so-called, what you now call earth changes. At that time it was called uh, Nostradamus and other prophecies. Yes, yes. And my partner did in Germany big yoga courses in Hindu astrology and he felt it very unsafe. Uh, and then we migrated and nothing happened. So I just want to say, even though nothing happened, mm -hmm. it was really good for all of us mm -hmm. to go to Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's not something bad if it nothing happens. It's really good. No, if it's, really good. <laughs> it's, it's really good if nothing happens. Yeah. I agree. You at least get the push and throw out all your stuff. You really throw out all your stuff. And you start you embracing need... some desires. Yeah. Like you really start embracing them rather than just putting them off, putting them off, putting them yeah. off. Yeah, I, I agree. Like if 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 nothing happens at all and everybody has moved, I think that's fantastic. You can always go <laughs> you can always go back. You yeah? can always go back. But but in this process you've challenged fears, you've challenged different desires you've got, you've worked out different things about yourself all through this process. It's a really quite a beautiful process. Now um, I do feel something will happen, that all being said. <laughs> However, um, you know, these things have been said for many years because many of the spirits involved have known about them coming for many years and then they impress people. And, it, and to be frank, it does help you a lot if you are prepared. Mm. Like, when I say prepared, I mean those basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter, water, those basic necessities. If you're prepared to provide them for yourself, then no matter where you go, you're going to be pretty self-sufficient. It's going to be quite good no matter what you do. And it's going to be quite good even if nothing happens because you'll, you'll have less impact on the environment, you'll have more self-responsibility and you'll have less money going out paying for other people to give <laughs> yeah. you those things. Yeah. Yeah. And also every time one moves, one sheds a lot of stuff. Yes. Because you don't want to move with all the stuff. You, <laughs> exactly. you never look at it. Exactly. Yeah, just Memories, yeah, I think I've yeah. moved 22 times in my life or something like that. 22. Yeah, about that, 22. Um, it might even be more than that, actually. Yeah, something around that figure. And, and I found that, like, by the end of it, I'm good at it. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is you just get rid of everything except for the things that fulfil your desires and passions, and, and then you just keep those. You keep those with you wherever you go. And it's just wonderful then. When you move, it's a lot easier then to move, yeah. I find it hard to part with my books. Yep, so do I. That's and why they move with me. <laughs> they're a lot and they're heavy. Yep. And? And I don't know. <laughs> like, do I get food with me or do I carry the books? Because, like, I. Well, I know that if you have a choice between the two, which one you'd probably choose. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, if you do things in a prepared way, why wouldn't you do both? You see, this is the beauty of doing things in prep with preparation. With preparation, you get to do more of what you want. If you have to do things in a hurry, you're not going to get more, to, more of what you want. You're only going to get the very bare necessities. See, and this is why... So, so my suggestion is do it so that you can get all the things you're comfortable with and all the things you want. Don't do it when it's the last minute and all you can carry is the stuff on your back and the food in your tummy. Not going to last long like that. Yeah? <laughs> big, big breath on that one. You see, you see, yeah, yeah, through the diagram. And um, yeah, they, you see, um, a lot of us don't understand that that if we leave things to last minute, or we rely on other people to do things for us, we are really, if we do the second, we're not taking personal responsibility for our life. And whenever you don't take personal responsibility for your life, it always ends up in heartache sometime. Secondly, if you're doing things at the last minute, you're always going to miss out things, as you know. Like, you know in your day-to-day -day life, if you wait till the last minute to get things done, it never gets done as good as you could have done it if you had done it differently. And so my suggestion is, if you've received inspiration, follow the inspiration now. Don't put it off to the last minute. Right? If you haven't received inspiration, look at the emotional reasons why you haven't. So there will always be some emotional reasons why you haven't received inspiration. And that might be that, you know, that you're just very frightened about some subjects. And it might not be anything to do with your death that you're frightened about. It might be more about family or friends or work or, or money or, and a lot of other things that we're often frightened about that cause us to not act. 
So uh, deal, deal with those, address with those issues. Allow yourself to address those issues. Don't, don't put them off. But also, go through your life and work out what supports your desires and get rid of everything else. <laughs> get rid of everything that does not support your desires. Because in the end, it's your desires that will help you grow. Anything that doesn't support your desires is just like a lead weight around your neck, dragging you back to another place that you don't need to be. And a lot of our possessions are like that. A lot of our possessions are just like lead weights weighing us down. And we, you know, at the end of the day, we don't need a lot of them. But if you need them to support your desire, then definitely get them. <laughs> yeah, definitely have them. We have a friend uh, that we just visited before we came away um, who just realised that she has a passion for painting. So she hasn't bought anything else. She's bought a few bits of trees and stuff she's planted in her yard and everything else. But she's got one room of her house filled with um, canvases <laughs> and all the painting gear that she needs. Because she, she, she wants to paint and so she's done that. And it's something that she would have done, whether changes were happening or not. She's going to need these things if she wants to engage that passion that she's got. So that's become her high priority. And I think that's awesome if we do that. So if music's your passion and you don't learn how to play an instrument, come all the electricity gone, all the electricity gone and no batteries, what are you going to do with the music? That's my issue. <laughs> Yeah, have you? No, it's the most loud microphone. The most loving thing to do would be to play an instrument, to create your own music, and to express yourself. Exactly. That's the loving thing. That's the loving thing. And you have the the compromise position, which is yes, which is buy a solar. Uh, pl uh, Recharger, yes. an MP3 player, yes. and fill it up with stuff. Yes, so do that. Yeah, that's the second <laughs> best thing to do. That's what I would do. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Does that make sense? Like, if something's your passion, then do what you can do now to make sure that your passion is going to survive. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. What about tools? They have one purpose only. Tools. 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 I mean, a plier. You can do a lot of things with a plier, but it has one purpose. I mean, like uh, in my car, I always carry with me uh, chains because of the snow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always. And I live in Greece. <laughs> yeah. But the few times I found snow and I couldn't move and I really need them, I didn't have them. <laughs> 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 but it's a tool. So what should I do with it? I feel a tool has more than one purpose. Yeah. A tool is an expression of your own creativity for a start. So it always has the purpose to create. So it's not just the tool's purpose to do its job, but also it's your it's purpose to serve you in your, your ah, process of creation. In your desire. Exactly. Ah, so it has more than one purpose. Mm -hmm. And yeah. many tools have far more than two purposes. Of course. <laughs> and, and so for that reason, um, I've got a shed full of tools. <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me. I have no money. How am I supposed to find all this desire for tools? I always had numerous tools to work with. Yeah. Because what I learned in my job is... Nico, when you, when you engage your passion, yeah. you'll be surprised what people give you. Mm, that's nice, yeah. People give you all sorts of things. Like, we give away lots of things already ourselves, and, and lots of people give us things too. Like... We get all sorts of gifts given to us. You know, some people have grown a plant and they give us a plant, you know. And there's all sorts of things that we get given. I only got a chair, man. But it's a really fine one. <laughs> I really desire to buy a chair. And if, uh, the, my best friend gave me one. And yeah. it's a full leather, comfortable... Uh, can but, you see what you just it's, said, Nico? It's only one chair, man. No, but can you see what you just said? I really desired one. You really desired one, and how did you get it? From my best friend. He gave me one. So you didn't even have to pay for it? No. So why are you asking a question about the tools? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, I, I got it. Yeah, yeah. 
okay. Yeah, <laughs> simple. It's the same thing, same principle. <laughs> Does everyone understand what I'm saying there with, with regard to the basics? So, so when it comes to this earth change discussion, I hopefully have just given you a bit of a skeleton or a sketch of what, you know, where I feel will be safe, not safe and so forth. But you also have seen a bit of yesterday in today, like where you need to follow direction that you're given by your spirit guides. But you also need to embrace personal responsibility. Embrace the desire to create for yourself. Don't rely on a government or an institution to provide your basic necessities. You can create these for yourself. Create them for yourself. Don't rely on others to create them for you. If you rely on others to create them for you, sooner or later you're going to be disappointed because it's going to be a collective law of attraction that determines what happens to it. And I don't know about you, but I am not very... Um, I'm not feeling very reliant on the world's collective law of attraction to provide what I want at this point in time. <laughs> because of the world being in so much fear, right? So, yeah. Um, so when it's a family situation, and uh, say it's four of us, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and maybe all of us, each one has a different desire. Mm -hmm. So how is that going to come about? Do we split as a family or how yeah, do we... If, if, if your desires are not coexistent, then why would you prevent any of your family from following their desires? See, see you know, this whole idea of family on earth, it is just so distorted. Like, many of us already know that when you get married, do you stay with your parents? Most of the time, no, right? What you do is... Unless you, it's Greece. Unless it's Greece, right? What you do... <laughs> what you do is you marry the person and you create your own life, do you not? All right. So, so we accept, under the conditions of marriage, that we're allowed to create our own life. Well, why can't we create our own life at any time? Well, we can. We are so addicted to the concept that the family has to live in the same place that we prevent members of the family from following their own desires. F families don't have to stay in the same place. We're all one family anyway, for a start. We're all God's children, so therefore we're all brothers and sisters. So I don't force you to stay in my house. So why would you force your son to stay in yours? The only thing that would cause you to do so is an addiction of some kind an addiction to being a mother, an addiction to feeling like you're a good provider, an addiction to, what, well, one of the biggest addictions most mothers and fathers have is, I'm afraid what they'll do without me being there to control them, right? And these are all addictions. We, don't, we can give them all up. We don't need them. And in the spirit world, to be frank, you don't have them. You don't have the ability to, to control other people's life like that. If they have desires they want to follow, no matter what their age, they go off and follow them, whether you want to go along with them or not. And that happens with little children, like three, four, five years of age. They're off doing their thing, following their desires. Whether you want to be with them or not, they'll go and do it. And most people on earth, when they pass in the spirit world, get so stressed out about that. But nothing can happen to them. They can't die. <laughs> so what, what are you worried about? All right. You understand? Like, you've already passed. You can't die again. So, so, of course, nobody has as much fear as they have here on Earth about people following their desires and passions in directions they want to go. So my answer to that question is, yes, everybody in the family gets to follow exactly what they want to do with their life. Everyone. Even between the couple. Even between the couple. And if you are soulmates and you follow your desires, you'll eventually find yourselves having very, very similar, if not identical, desires. If you are not soulmates, when you follow your desires, you'll find your desire leads you to your soulmate. <laughs> and it won't be the person you're with, perhaps. But, but if everybody engages their desires, you will end up the happiest you can possibly be. Every single person will end up the happiest they can possibly be. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if my soulmate uh, is very mediumistic and a very good medium... Are you very mediumistic? 
Yes, yes, I guess. So it's a high likelihood your soulmate would be. Okay. Yeah. Far away. <laughs> <laughs> if my soulmate works through a lot of their mediumship issues, does that make it easier for me to just sort of slip through them too? <laughs> slip through and control them so they come and visit me at some point? <laughs> I'm suggesting, what are your intentions? I mean, I, my feeling is that some things with mediumship I've just been able to s snap into really quickly mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if, I don't know, there's a soul correlation there. But... Of course there will be. Okay. Yeah. And that makes it easier, I suppose. So one soulmate does it and then for the next soulmate it's of course. Kind of just easier. Anything that one soulmate does to embrace their own passions and desires instantly assists the other half of themselves to do the same thing whether the other half of themselves is in their life or not at that time. Yep. And if you're asking, can I go and talk with him and influence him in his decisions? Well, of course you can, but I would question how loving that is. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> what is correlation? And when two things are sort of equal or, or similar to each other. Yes. Good question. So have we had enough of that subject? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, guys, for uh, for our time here. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, hopefully, uh, this little discussion has answered some of your questions about what I feel about earth changes, but also what I feel about how's the best way to go about resolving some of the problems associated with the knowledge of such things. So that hopefully it has resolved that. Sure, you can. I um, just want to thank you so much Thanks, Katarina. for coming again. Yeah. Such a wonderful gift. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. For thanks taking for... the time to just going all over the world. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Help me out. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone all over the world paid for it. Like <laughs> uh, Myself really and Mary had no money to come overseas. And, and I think actually most of our trip was paid for by our people in Sweden. So, so we'd really like to thank them. Oh, thank you for, guys in Sweden. <laughs>